uh, this series of workshops is ongoing through the winter and spring. Watch for upcoming sessions on grants for individuals next week. And then after that, the on the process of converting live performance to virtual delivery, on shaping a public art submission, effective advertising on social media, uh, registering uh, your, your arts practice as a business, uh, uh, the pricing visual art, a whole bunch of fun things coming up. If you have any topics that you would love to see in the future, please either send me a message, uh, perhaps uh, in private, um, in the chat function on the side, or email us at grants at edmontonarts.ca. We are honored to be working and living in Treaty 6 territory and to be the beneficiaries of generations of stewardship by the First Nations, Dene and Métis peoples. The Edmonton Arts Council is striving to extend that spirit of fellowship and peace that is represented by Treaty 6. Be um, tonight, we are thrilled to have Janice Richardson with us. In the past year, many crucial but hastily created federal programs have provided a vital support network for our industry. Programs like CERB were essential for the survival of tens of thousands of arts workers across the country. And now we have to figure out how to report all of this and integrate it, integrate it into our overall um, uh, reporting process. Uh, Janice Richardson now runs her own financial uh, practice, um, but has spent also spent years on the inside interpreting Revenue Canada's regulations. Um, she now brings all of that wisdom here to us. Please join me in welcoming Janice Richardson. Thank you so much, David, for inviting me. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, I just realized I screwed up your name at the very last moment. Over to you. Don't worry about it. I have definitely been called worse. Um, <laughs> Having worked for CRA for years, uh, some people don't really like you. But then now that I have my own business, it's a whole different ball game. So thank you so much, David, and for the Arts Council for inviting me. I also have my uh, assistant, Megan, here to uh, help me out, especially with the technical issues or, or anything else that pops up. So <laughs> Megan's right there. And if we have to get close, uh, please be advised that we will mask up. Uh, we're far away enough now that we don't have to. So I guess it's time, everybody, that I put on the PowerPoint. So you're gonna be able to ask questions. We won't stop for everybody's question. We will stop for ones where we go, uh-oh, we're really leaving people questioning what this is about. But we will be discussing all questions at the end and everybody will have a chance to do a, a Q and A at the end as well. Hey, we're starting with um, my business, G Rich Business Services, myself, and this is Tax Information Seminar for the Arts, but a lot of people will be able to use this information. Um, I'm just going to find the buttons down here. Okay, due to the limitations, um, we're not going to be able to answer extremely complex questions on many of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit programs. As you can see at the bottom, there's, look at them. <laughs> CERB, CESB, CRB, CRSB, CRCB, CEBA, CEWS, and CERS. Let me tell you, it gets very confusing. And there are really good Q&As regarding different scenarios on the CRA website. And I must say, that's a really good place for you to start. Because let's say you were getting the CERB for part of the time, and then you switched over to EI. Start there. And then you're going, going to say, okay, I need to talk to a professional. We've got a problem here. We're going to cover some of it as we're going through, but I want you to also understand part of the problem is, is that they're changing the criteria constantly. And I think you've heard about this. So we've had criteria when it first came out being very vague. Now they're making it more specific and people are going, what are you talking about? That wasn't there at first. So now maybe I don't qualify. And that one of the ones is CERB, which we will get a bit more into CERB later. As you can see, there's many ones, especially for people that have bigger businesses, maybe have gotten the SEBA. There's different rules for how you qualified, and then they brought in another set of rules. Um, the CELEWS is the wage program to have a wage subsidy. So there's a whole bunch of different things. So I just want to let you know, start with the CRI site, their Q&As first, because they've got the fairly good right now. Don't you think, Megan? Yeah. 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 
Now I found I can't see myself, which is weird. I always thought I could see myself. And, <laughs> I can't see myself. Oh well. Uh, okay, scams. Let, we're going to touch into scams, and then we're going to go back to the CERB. When in doubt, ask yourself the following. There are so many scams out there. The CRA site has a lot of them, and I find two. If I Google them, just I'm going to think I need my glasses for it. I'm going to do. Um, if you Google the scam, often it'll show up scam. I just got an email that said this, this, and this, and it says it's coming from EI or CRA. Uh, first of all, CRA will never, ever send you an email without first going, you have an email in my account. You must have set up my account or my business account. Otherwise, they'll never, they say to you, do that, because they want you to go to the CRA site and open up your my account, my business account to get your email. If you get any other email, it's a scam. And if there's a link in there, never press the link because that for sure is going to cause problems. But it may add uh, viruses or malware or anything like that. And also they're going to be asking you very personal questions to uh, steal your identity. So that's why we say, did I provide my email address on my tax return? No, there's nowhere on your tax return to provide it. You'd have to set up my account or my business account. When you get a notice you're getting money from CRA, uh, why? Did you get an assessment notice that said you're getting a $25 refund when you originally filed your tax return? Okay, but if you get one down the road, what changed? Okay, always got to look at what they're saying. Does this really sound too good to be true? I'm getting $2,000 back. Here, put your personal information in. Well, CRA has your personal information. They don't need that. There may be times they phone you. There is no doubt they're sometimes going to phone you, especially now to prove who you are, or if there's a problem or um, I don't know how they can phone you because it takes two and a half hours to phone them. But anyway, sometimes they do. If you are not sure if that's a real a CRA agent, you can phone 1-800-O-Canada and say, this agent with this ID number from Ontario, ONT, do they exist? And 1-800-O-Canada kind of ties in all the federal programs. They can look up the list and say, no, that person doesn't exist or does exist. So that's, or because that's, you can get through to 1 800 of Canada a lot easier than you can get through to CRA. Right, Megan? Yeah. <laughs> Megan was on the phone for five hours one day. Okay, here's the request you're asking for information that CRA already has on file. There are times that they make a phone call, but those phone calls you can usually tell right away because they're saying, you owe money. If you don't pay within seven days, we're going to take your firstborn child, which there was at one time I would have given them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they want to be paid in Bitcoin or they want to meet you or they send the police to your door. Uh, every one of those is a scam. Every one. And I want everybody to know maybe you get it, but maybe your mom doesn't get it. Your aunt doesn't get it. Your grandma doesn't get it. Always be open with them and help them out. Because a lot of older people are afraid to say they think they might have been scammed. Now, thank God the banks are catching on, especially to taking out large amounts of money. And then they might say, oh, you owe? Why do you owe? Did you get anything in the mail from CRA saying they reassessed your return? Did they send you something saying you're, they're doing an audit? Um, they're going to send a lot of that stuff in the mail or through your my account or my business account. So that kind of covers the scams. But yeah, and CRA never threatens you. They can sound a little intimidating when you're dealing with collections for months, but they're never going to threaten you. If it's in the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, they're not allowed to. You can get them fired right away. Um, oops, oops, I went two times. I goofed. Hang on here. Okay, here's our outline. We're going to cover repayment of CERB or the CRB, which is Canada uh, Recovery Benefit. Canada, Canada, Canada Emergency Relief Benefit, and the CRB is the Canada Relief Benefit, right? Is it something like, anyways, you always see these. Is it Canada Relief Benefit, Megan? I think so. She'll tell you, because I get the names mixed up sometimes. We know what about the CERB, and I'm sure most of you who have had to apply for the CRB every two weeks know about that one. So we're going to talk about the repayment. We're going to talk a little bit about the differences that happens if you're employed or self-employed. Yes? Oh, Canada Recovery Benefit. <laughs> Sorry, there we got it right. We're going to talk about a little bit difference of what you can claim when you're employee or self-employed. I would presume most of you that are with the Edmonton Arts Council are self-employed, but there may be times when you're only an employee because you've got no self-employed work. So we can cover a few different things an employee can deduct. 
But when you're self-employed, we're going to go through keeping records. What do I include in income? What expenses can I deduct? What can I depreciate, which is the same as capital cost allowance? If you hear either one of those two terms, they're basically the same thing. When do I register for GST? That's a big one I find with a lot of people. When do I register? What do I do with this? GST fats, donating services to charities, which is a very complicated area. And so is what is inventory. We're just going to touch on those tonight. We're going to give you a little bit of information. You're always welcome to phone me up. Every person at this seminar will be allowed. And I'm going to have to cut it back a little bit this year, at least 15 minutes free, that we can give you some advice, tell you, show you what you can do, um, because we're going into filing season. So it's a little difficult to spend more than half an, you know, half an hour with everyone. Uh, what is a business summer audit and important dates? So that's what we're covering here. So the first one, which everybody is probably going, oh my God, the CERB and the CRB. So CRA and in their infinite wisdom has issued uh, 441,000 letters to people advising them. They don't meet the qualifying CERB requirements. At the very, very beginning in March, which I think was March 15th, they did not say you had to have net self-employed income of at least 5,000. That came out later. They just said, if you had self-employed income of 5,000, we've got a lot of people off on the wrong track right to begin with. So it's really unclear at this time if they'll be resolved. There's a ton of petitions out there. The uh, CA Association, the, um, the tax lawyers are going after CRA saying, whoa, whoa, you cannot just change the criteria way after the fact. And this is where the problem's coming in. So they're saying to anybody who got the, but one of those letters, sit back. I'll tell you what you can do. If you're super, super concerned, say, I'm not gonna sit back, I don't know what to do, and I don't have the 14,000, what can I do? Your return for 2019 can be reassessed. We take away some of the expenses. You are never required to claim expenses. You are required legally to report income. You don't have to claim expenses. So if you were less than 5,000, we can go in and take some of the expenses out. I've done that for three clients already because they were so nervous. They just wanted to get this done. The amount you pay in difference from minus, let's say 2,000 to reporting 5,000 is very minimal compared to paying back $14,000. Another way to do this is that their criteria, and this hasn't changed, so just a minute. Do you want to take that little puppy out? We have, I have two little rescue puppies and it's being a little barking away. <laughs> I'm not sure what. So if you, their criteria was in March when you could first apply, it said, if in the 12 preceding months, you made 5,000 employment income or 5,000 in self-employed income, which now they're saying net, net means after expenses, it has to be at least 5,000. You can straddle the 2019 and 2020 years. So let's say in 2020, you go, I did. I did make at least 5,000 along the way in 2020. You could report that as self-employed income and not have to worry about meeting this criteria that you didn't meet in 2019. So that is another way to get around it. And I have had artists go, whoa, I didn't, you know, I maybe was really super low in 2019, but in 2020, I did make a little extra in January, February, and the beginning of March. I can get over the 5,000 if I don't claim any expenses. So just wait, yes. I think she might have misunderstood. That 5,000 is for the year. Yeah, and you need more than 5,000. You need more than 5,000 to qualify. 5,000 in self-employed income after expenses. So you could have made 10,000 gross income you have all these expenses and it brings you down to 5,000, you're good. But if you go down to minus, if you go down to 1,000, you're not. But CRA didn't tell us that difference at first. So this is where it's going to get, if you got one of the letters, really and truly, it's best to call someone like myself, or if you have a professional that you're using already, call and find out what you can do. You can either sit and wait it out because I think they're going to have to say, uh oh, if this person really made under $5,000, why are we going after them for $14,000? Think about that. Oh, well, let's go after the big companies for the $60,000 loan they got. Let's go after the companies that took the uh, wage subsidy that didn't use it for their clients. Let's go after the bigger people. Um, but they seem to be going after the small person. So, there's other reasons you might not be eligible for the CERB. 
So what you want to do is there's a repayment quiz on the CRA site. It's let's say you applied for CERB through CRA and EI that you can't double dip. So you'd have to pay part of that back. That's for a different reason. Now, are we, are we clear on that or did it confuse the heck out of everybody? Okay, good, good. <laughs> now, if you go and you switched from the CERB, the CERB, to the CRB, you have to repay that CRB if you made more than 38,000 of net income in 2020 excluding the amount you receive for the CRB. So that that amount's not included, but anything else you make is included. Now you have to repay back 50 cents of every dollar you made above the 38,000 to a maximum of the CER, CRB you received. They're not asking you to normally pay back the CERB unless you got one of these stupid letters. Oh, pardon me, one of these letters. <laughs> But they will ask you to pay back the CRB if your income, your net income, exceeds 38000 There's a problem with what they're defining as net income there, too. This is, this is why this all gets super confusing, and, and CRA has got to figure this out a bit better and advise the average person, because a lot of us are having problems with it. That word net income there does not mean your net self-employed income. It means all your income minus uh, child care expenses, minus RRSPs. They, they've picked a whole different line of the tax return. So it maybe if you're over 38,000, you think, oh, well, maybe I could go get a loan, buy some RRSPs, and then cash them in afterwards and pay them back. There's always a way to get around some of this stuff. So we're just letting you know, and there's mass confusion, mass confusion about this area right now. So keep watching the news and see if we can't get some clarification or you can phone myself or your own professional as i said before and see if you can get some insight into your personal problem um we'll talk more about this at the end because i think this is where we're going to have a whole lot of questions so employee or self-employed there's a limitation on expenses for employees and you've got to be careful here most of you are self-employed you go into the second category but if you wound up being an employee for part of the year you get to claim em employment expenses if your employer says you can on a form that's called a T2200, which you can Google, download, and see it. And now they're giving people who were employees a special way to claim office and home expenses due to COVID-19. Doesn't affect the self-employed person. These are different. So you have an option one or an option two. If you fall into this category, I want you to Google this T777S. It's actually kind of, it's quite written quite well. It is. Yeah. That's where when you hear people go, well, I could claim $2 a day for up to $400. That's office and home due to COVID if you are an employee, and that's option one. And then they'll have option two. Most of you are self-employed. Therefore, you can claim your office and home like you always have been based on the square footage of your home. And we go into that more later. So when you're self-employed, something I want to remind everybody, and this comes up with every seminar, you are, most of you may be proprietorship. So it's just you. You report your income on your personal tax return. And some people have incorporated. Do not ever incorporate. Someone tells you to without getting professional advice. I have closed down more corporations and put people back to proprietorships because they never knew what kind of mess they were getting into and the cost involved with the corporation and the formal bookkeeping involved with the corporation. So just make sure you're fully informed before you do that. Those of you who are running corporations, if you have any specific questions at the end, we can deal with some of your questions with your corporation. When you're in a proprietorship, all you are is you have to report your income on the accrual basis. That means income is reported when earned, not when received. And that's gonna make a big, big difference for the 1,000 per month, right, Megan? That they, you had to be under 1,000 a month net income. So this is what, sorry? Oh, you can be both. But a lot of employees are not allowed to claim office and home exp employment expenses. Let's say if you work at, just pick something um mcdonald's okay which is not a, probably a good example but let's say you worked at mcdonald's you would be an employee there's no way an employee at mcdonald's would have employment expenses that their employer would sign off on 
So if you're self-employed, this is where you want to claim your expenses. You want to claim your office and home and all your other expenses there. A lot of people do both. Most artists, because of the in, the way the industry works, you do have to have some type of job, uh, employment job, and then your self-employed proprietorship or corporation. I know some people are incorporated. And when you're a proprietorship, you prepare a T2125 business and income financial statement that goes on your personal tax return. And if you need more information about that, I can help people. But if you download a T2125 and you look at the form, you go, oh, these are the expenses I can deduct. You have to lump them into categories because so, they don't have very many categories, do they? Oh, sorry? Yeah. Most self report income on a basis. Yes. Yes. Oh, if you are self employed, you have to report it on the cruel basis, which means income is you have to report income when we when earned, not when received. And expenses, on the other hand, are claimed when incurred but not paid. So you don't have to worry about paying off that visa for the next because you might not do it for two or three years. You get to claim your expense when incurred. And income is to be reported on the accrual basis, which is going to affect a lot of people getting grants. So I want someone to star this one and ask me at the end why. Because especially if you want to know if you were over the $1,000 to get the CERB, this may affect you big time. The accrual basis. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. So Megan, just put a star beside that so we can deal with accrual there. Okay, when you're in business, of course, you've got to keep proper paperwork. A lot of people say, oh, I can just keep my bank statements or my credit card statements. Absolutely not. That's not enough. You need to attach your receipt, the actual receipts to that credit card statement or bank statement um, because you have no way to prove exactly what you bought without the receipt. And this is, and GST, our lovely GST people, if you wind up being registered for GST, and I'm sure some of you definitely are, you cannot claim the GST unless you show the receipt that shows exactly how much GST you paid, who you paid it to, and their registration number. So this is really important. Uh, excuse me. For some reason, I have an itchy nose. Maybe it's because the dog was in here. Um, you can scan documents, but always, always back them up. You can take pictures of them. You can scan them, uh, but you keep that original paperwork in a box somewhere, okay? And if you paid something cash, take a picture of it or maybe you have a debit receipt, something, or create an invoice to give to someone, some way to prove I charged someone for this, so here's my invoice, or I paid cash for something because I met somebody at, at Tim Hortons and I bought something off Kijiji. So take a picture, create an invoice that you paid this person, okay? And then you can always keep, as you know, a lot of my clients have my Excel spreadsheets, and these will be available to anybody in the uh, that's part of the Arts Council, okay? I sent them before, David, but we can send that spreadsheet again. It helps you keep track of your income and expenses into the categories that matches the tax software. Um, you may want to use QuickBooks. You want, may use one of Simply Accounting, Wave, uh, Fresh. There's so many things out there. Before you use any software, educate yourself because I have seen such tremendous messes. It's it's crazy. With I don't know if there's a dog at the door. Oh, <laughs> there's a dog at the door. <laughs> she wants in. Uh, so educate educate yourself because a lot of people make a mess of the software, and that's why Excel spreadsheets can be the easiest thing ever. Um, what do you include in income? Performance fees, service fees, and a written or verbal contract. It doesn't matter if it's written or verbal, but written's always better. Value of amount in a rider for people who are musicians. They don't like that one, and often people don't report them. Um, royalties, sale, sale of your inventory, your T-shirts, your hats. Um, sponsorship income, barter transaction. What's that? Oh, dear. No, but I have never seen a barter transaction reported in my life. And I worked for CRA as a business tax auditor for 35 years. Well, 33. Pardon me. I just rounded up because I'm an accountant. That's what we do. <laughs> a barter transaction is saying, I will do this show for you if you fix my truck for me. And those will have equal values. But think of it. One of them may be a business transaction. One of them may be a personal transaction. You're, and sometimes they're both business transactions. That's why you really hardly ever, ever see those reported. If you get a grant, federal or provincial, you have to report those. 
And depending what box they're on the T4A depends on where you report them on your tax return. That is often confusing, but now when, when you go to someone to do your tax return, they download the information off the CRA site, it populates onto the correct box right away. And the T4A slips will be issued for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit Program, and they've already started mailing them out. You've had some clients get them, haven't you, Megan? I just want to get them my screen with me. Am I still in the picture? Oh, you don't see me. Oh, good. Oh, well, yeah, I thought you could. You could see me up. No? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so mailing out the T4A slips, be very careful if you've had to repay some that they actually deducted that. I think we're going to see a bunch of problems whole bunch of problems because there's nowhere on the tax return to claim that you paid back part of the CERB. You're supposed to have paid it back before December 31st, so it didn't wind up in a T4A. So keep your eyes out. Yes. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. I guess if it's not on your 2020 slip, it would be on your 2021 slip. We have to wait and see what happens. Really, we've got a whole bunch of unanswered questions here. So deduct expenses, this is part everybody loves, is the expenses. So non-deductible expenses called no, no, never. Golf fees. Uh, you usually really see golf fees more with people that are networking like realtors and stuff like that. They love to claim that kind of stuff. Uh, meals and snacks, snacks for personal consumption, unless you're on travel status. You have to be away from your municipality to claim meals and snacks. You can't claim them, oh, I'm leaving my house on the west end, going to the north end of Edmonton, and I need to grab a Timmy's and a donut because I'm, I'm really hungry. No, you can't claim that. CRA has this thing that you should have got your food from home unless you're on travel status, so unless you went to Calgary, you can claim everything there. We'll go more, much more into meals later. We have another slide. We're clothing and related cleaning. Ugh, that's touchy, especially with artists. But most work clothing, like if I have to dress to go into CRA, I can't claim that work clothing. There's certain times, especially if it's safety related or um, some of the cameramen have to wear all black outfits and black non-scuff shoes. They've been getting away with claiming that. Uh, so that's that's a gray area, gray, okay? Gym memberships, um, unless, I've had people say, well, I had to get, I had to buff up to get this certain part in a play and blah, blah, blah. You're gonna have to fight really hard with CRA to get that deduction. So you better talk to professional first and see if you have a proper way to back that up. It's in the contract you had to buff up or something. Um, protein drinks and vitamins, no, it's not prescribed by a doctor. And even if a doctor prescribed that, they won't allow it. Plastic surgery, unless for medical purposes, that goes somewhere else on your tax return. Hair and makeup for promotional purposes, such as business cards, is, it has to, I didn't write that, right? It should be four. Four. Yeah. If you're in a cafe all day working, you can't claim your meal that you purchased to sit down on the Wi-Fi. No. They want to know why. Okay. And then also someone wants to know why not golf fees? Okay, golf yeah. fees are just legislated. And that's, it's in the tax act. It says specifically says golf fees. Um, and yacht expenses, unless you are Jimmy Patterson and your yacht is actually your true place of business, or you were uh, <laughs> renting out your yacht on a continuous basis. Those are things that are specifically in the tax act that we can't even... But get, should we tell me about the meals at the golf course? This is fun. You can't claim golf fees. But if you go to the clubhouse and entertain a client because you're networking with them, you could claim that meal as a business meal. The tax act is uh, strange. I, I, you know, it just, it doesn't make sense to me sometimes, but this is the way, these are very strict ones. So I put hair and makeup, oh yeah, hair and makeup and less for pr promotional purposes, such as business cards, videos, etc. But let's say you were doing a very fancy performance somewhere and you had to do your hair and makeup totally different and you had to pay someone to do it, that could be claimed. Now, if sitting in a cafe situation, when you buy a meal, this is not a business meal because you're only paying for your own personal consumption. When we're talking meals, you can deduct. You have to be networking with someone 
or uh, and taking them out for for dinner. That's where you're having your meeting, and you have chosen to pay, do this. This is where you're meeting for having a meeting as by a meal, and you are paying for both parties. So just sitting in a cafe all day, uh, CRA would go. Well, that was your choice, okay? Trust me, if you threw the odd one in here or there, no one's going to notice. But if you're doing it every day, it would show up, right? Do we have any more questions about that right now? Uh, no. no. Uh, yeah. Okay. If, if I wasn't... Oh, sorry, oh, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Can you not change your branded image? Uh, okay, branded image. That's a good question. Dolly Parton definitely has a branded image. Um, she never goes out of the house without looking like Dolly Parton. Um, that's a branded image. Now, if you go on stage all the time, you have a totally dim different image than your Safeway image, then that could be deducted. But there's a fine line, as you can see. Um, a lot of people these days don't keep dressed up and having their hair and makeup done as, as they appear on stage or on TV or film. There are a few but very few, a lot of artists um, and actors and actresses are very much more casual these days. So unless you have a branded image, you keep going 24 seven, I would say no. Okay. Because um, the rest of us have to get our hair. And I don't get my makeup done too often, maybe for a wedding, but I have to, you know, you get your hair done, right? Uh, and you don't get to deduct it because you want to look decent in a, a Zoom meeting or something like that, or I have to go to clients. Um, Legal and accounting fees are deductible. So if you have to pay me, you get to deduct it. Union dues, professional memberships are deductible. Um, an agent's commission. So you have an agent trying to get you that part and apply. You can deduct their commission. Subcontract payments. Um, musicians, you have to hire a guitar, a couple of guitar players and a drummer for, for your gig. Then you get to uh, uh, claim what you pay them. Okay. Um, makeup and hairstyling, here it is, required for public appearances, photo shoots, videos, etc. So just, I, I said it in the other one, what you can't deduct, this is what you can deduct. And you can see it's a gray area. You're going to have to weigh out, do you absolutely have to get this makeup and hair done for your business? Was it required for your business purposes? CD, replication and duplication, for those of you who are musicians, you know that you can deduct that. Uh, a lot of times the actual master is a capital item which we'll catch up on later um, more expenses publicity transportation board and lodging videotaping demos podcasts websites telephone yes okay yes yeah, okay, so this is where you get into the one right behind. Okay, we're gonna we have a separate one on meals, by the way, and that's why we've got that little star there. I'm gonna go more into meals because this is a big one. Uh, we have a separate slide. Wardrobe, wardrobe costumes used solely for performance. Think of this one. I had an artist who was very young and who had to identify as a true country singer, who wore. Um, fringes on on the jeans and sparkles and always belts and different shirts and cowboy hats and hat belt boots massive amount of cowboy boots that all matched okay i was challenged my management company was challenged by cra even though i worked there um as well that that was not considered a wardrobe and i said that kind of wardrobe could not be worn to school for that artist down the street or in Safeway, so that was only, that wardrobe was specifically for performance. Lady Gaga, solely for performance. Um, well, sometimes she wears some strange stuff out, but share. <laughs> uh, um, so let's say you have to, you buy certain clothing that you wear only on stage that you couldn't or wouldn't wear anywhere else. You probably have to make a really good uh, case for it because CRA can be very touchy depending on the cost. If it's kind of minimal, you, it, no one's going to ask you. It's all materiality with them. They're going to look at how much you're deducting. So, by the way, I won an appeals for that wardrobe because the auditor didn't understand that people in, in St. Albert don't dress up like cowboys all the time, maybe in Calgary, but not, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, anyways, 
repairs, alteration, and cleaning of clothes used for performances only. So your costumes and your wardrobe, you could deduct, but they have to be very specific. Do we have any more questions yeah, before we go? Yes. yes. Uh, let's go finish all the, these expenses okay. first, and then Megan's going to flag your questions, and then we'll get into them after we finish the expense area, okay? So website design and maintenance, um, definitely. Think about even like before we were talking about dues and subscriptions, so that would be Spotify or um, dues to um, Alberta Music or, you know, music. Uh, whatever, you can deduct those kind of things. You had to incur them for business purposes. Always keep that in mind. Did I have to incur that expense for business purposes? And if you didn't, then you choose your not deductible inks, along with golf fees <laughs> and certain ones like that. And no shakes, I don't know. They don't want you having shakes or vitamins or anything like that. You think they go for proactive uh, health care, but CRA doesn't do that yet. They're very archaic on a lot of things. We'll talk more about workspace in the home. Uh, as you can see, there's a separate slide. Cost of music, acting, or other lessons incurred for self-improvement in the artist, uh, artistic field. Definitely deductible. And we usually put them at the bottom of the T2125 and call them, um, uh, oh, what is it called? What do we call that? Um, professional development. Sorry, I lost for words there. Cost of industry related periodicals, vehicle, we're going to get into a bit more too with the little star there. Capital expenditures versus current depreciations. Okay, what is a capital asset and what's a current or is it a current expense? The best way to look at this, and there's a lot of court cases that sometimes can't figure this out either, okay, because it can be very gray area. Most of the time, though, if I go and buy a desk, it's an asset with an enduring benefit. So instead of being able to write that off all in one year, you get to depreciate it on a declining balance. Uh, so you get 20% uh, a year in class eight because there's different classes, right? And this is where you'll need a professional help or do a lot of research. What um, class is that asset? Um, musical instruments usually go into class eight. Um, a vehicle goes into class 10 or 10.1. So you don't deduct the cost of that vehicle in one year, you depreciate it because it has an enduring benefit. Basically, that's the idea between capital expenditures or current expense. So just keep that in mind. You buy a, let's see, so I know some of my musicians there, they buy very expensive guitars and amps and stuff like that that exceed $500, starts to put them in a class as a capital asset, and therefore needs to be depreciated. Not all expenses just because they're over $500 become an asset. So just keep it in mind, what is this and does it have an enduring benefit? Is this tangible asset, okay? Um, computers, filing cabinets, desks, all these kind of things, those are capital assets. Do we have any questions on capital assets? Because I tend to confuse people on that one sometimes. No. Okay, meals and entertainment. Okay, here we go. The, it, you have to keep your receipt. You have to have the name of the business associate or client, contact information, and the reason for meal. So usually it's like uh, Joe Smith, networking, and sometimes some people don't put the contact information, but that's the perfect amount of information CRA would like to see. That meal has to be to have to have um, a meeting or networking. If you were out of town because you had a gig out of town or a seminar out of town, you don't have to take somebody out for dinner to claim the meal because you're on travel status now. Keep that in mind. There's meals in town that have to be for meetings. Meals out of town, you're on travel status for your business and you can claim all food. Again, there's everything is subject to a 50% limitation. On our spreadsheets, you'll see put in 100%. We'll deal with the 50%. 100% of food, beverage, which alcohol is a beverage, uh, and the tip. You put the whole amount in. And um, if the gift certificates, if you gave someone a gift certificate wanted to deduct it in your business, you only get to deduct 50% because it's for food. 
you buy someone hockey tickets in your business because you want to network with some producer, okay? Say, oh, look, I got these great hockey tickets. Well, whenever we're able to go to a hockey game again. Um, and you can only deduct 50% because the CRA says meals and entertainment are only allowed at 50%. Your accountant or someone like myself has to know your 100%. So we can calculate the 50% of the GST if you're registered, okay? Just keep it in mind. Travel meals, in-town meals, two different type of meals. Do you have any questions on me? No. no. Okay, good. Business use of home. Oh, you were, sorry. sorry. Okay. Sure. Hmm. What would I do there? Members of a partnership, I, I would say yes. I would let your, I'd let the partnership just pay for the meal. That'll be one of the expenses of the partnership that if there's two people in that partnership, you're dividing the bottom line at the end of the day. But meeting, because some of the partners, you might have a partner that lives in Calgary, you might have one that lives in Edmonton, you, you know? So even though you're in a partnership, you might have to get together and you decide, we're gonna have a meal, so it's quiet. And there's no kids around. Yes, I would do that. Um, definitely. Is there any other steps? How many kilometers away would you consider traffic stopping? Well, <laughs> you're supposed to be away from your municipality. This is how archaic it's it is, right? That, that, that legislation was written so long ago that you needed to be away for at least 12 hours. So it means that if you went to Red Deer and back and you lived in Edmonton, you wouldn't qualify. But trust me, when I go to do seminars at the college in Red Deer, I definitely consider myself on travel status. So they would really be nitpicking that one. It, the idea is you can't get home to get that lunch you need. Or if you packed a lunch, it would have gone bad in that time. So I know it seems nitpicky, but if you can keep it reasonable, it will be fine. And that's the whole idea is if you're reasonable, um, CRA will be reasonable too, unless you're dealing with GST. Yes. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Uh, someone wants to know if travel meals and uh, meals in town are reported in separate categories. We well, what do we do? We you can you can you can put some under travel, or you can just put them all under meals and in the description area show what is a travel meal. I have all my clients that when they have a travel meal, they put it under meals. Mm -hmm but they put in the description area on my spreadsheet, travel meal. So I know that they went to Calgary or they went to Vancouver or they went to Northwest Territories. So I know that I can back them up when, when the questions are asked, okay? And that's when you're on travel stats. Remember, you can get Timmy's too. Timmy's and coffee, coffee and donut, you're ready to, you can claim that too when you're on travel status only. Okay, when you're a uh, business use a home, when you're self-employed, you get to claim part of your principal residence. If this is where you do your business, this is where you have your computer, your filing cabinets, or this is where you meet clients. Uh, often people in the arts may not be meeting clients at home so much, especially, well, especially nowadays, but this is where you earn your business income. You have no other place of business. This is where you're set up. This is maybe where you do your artwork. Um, this is where you do your sculptures, right? So you can deduct a percentage of your home. And it's on the T2125, so that's a business income and expense statement, is a little um, chart that shows you can have heat, electricity, insurance, mortgage interest. If you don't have a mortgage, you'd have rent, right? Water, property taxes, and security system. And that percentage you get to deduct is based on the square footage of your house you're setting aside to use for your business. Some people have more. Some people have a whole studio downstairs. Some have one attached to their house. So you're going to be including that square footage in the total square footage. The average person, like let's say myself, um, I have a large office in my home, is dedicated just for business, is not used for the kids to play in. They really get hack. I have grandchildren here. <laughs> they, they know, don't come into my office and touch anything. So. The normal amount that I can claim is about 15 to 20% based on the square footage of my home. However, because I store a lot of people's records uh, here, I use a lot of my garage as well. So I have to count that in as well. Okay, uh, office and home, so eligible vehicle. Oh, there's a the little car. You did make that little car. <laughs> I can always get a kick out of that little car. Okay. 
vehicle expenses, there's a little chart on the T2125 and on our spreadsheet as well that shows you license and registration, maintenance and repairs, insurance, fuel, parking, uh, and then things that are subject to limitation. And this is how darn archaic C CRA, I keep saying that, I know, but it's so true. You can only depreciate a car up to the value of 30000 they brought that in over 20 years ago. So a vehicle over 30,000 20 years ago was a pretty fancy vehicle. Now, oh, this is average vehicles are gonna be in your 30,000. Like they need to look at that. If you're leasing, you can only lease up to $800 a month. You can, if you have a bank loan, you can claim the interest on the, on the money you borrow and you should keep a mileage log, how many people do. Uh, not too many, but it's best to prove your mileage of your total mileage you drove that car compared to business and personal. And that's how you claim your vehicle expenses. You claim them based on how much you drove that, that vehicle for business. So in our spreadsheet, you put in 100% of the amount, and then we will calculate what percentage you get based on the mileage you have given us. Sometimes we have to guess a bit. And sometimes you've got to go back into your schedule, your day timer, your meetings, your contracts to figure out how much and where you went. But it's good to try. There's so many apps now. Get an app for take, you know, keeping track of mileage. And we talked a bit about depreciation. All I'm going to say is each one of these things, which is a car, musical instruments. Um, you, oh, sorry, that question. Uh, yeah. They're on personal vehicle. Can you claim this PCA? Yes. You can designate, but you're designated a portion of that. So that portion you're designating to claim the CCA is based on the mileage as well. So you can say, I'm using my vehicle 50% of the time for business. Some years it might be a little up or a little down, but the depreciation is usually based on, you know, usually it matches each year, you know, except now we've got a 2019 and 2020 year that people aren't traveling as much. So I presume most people will leave it about the same or when you drop it, we can drop how much CCA and change it. Let's so say now you used to use it 50%, now you use it 20%. You might only want to claim 20% of the depreciation that year. Yes? Somebody wants to know if uh, they don't have a vehicle and their sister, or their sister drives them and they pay the gas, can they claim the, the, the payment of the gas? Well, there's a problem with paying your sister for gas. Did they take the whole tank? Um, I would say that you would have to pay her a reasonable amount, either based on mileage. Uh, CRA has mileage rates based on the mileage or based on what it would have cost, cost you to take an Uber or a cab. I would come up with some reasonable amount that's not gas. Because just gas alone, um, I fill up my tank and it, well, it doesn't last long. <laughs> I have an SUV. It does not last long, especially in the winter time. I would base it on a better way. Let's say, just go. Okay, my Uber or my cab would have cost me twenty-five bucks. I'm paying my sister twenty-five bucks, and keep record of that. You would have to keep some type of record uh, that you paid her. It would be a very good idea. Uh, even if you wrote it down in a book somewhere. Okay, this is what I paid for my sister Uber. You know, really, that's about the best way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so, yeah. yeah. So here's your asset you can depreciate. There's lots more. This is just an example. Music library, your CD master, your pottery wheel, your easel, um, computer hardware and software, desk cabinets, workbenches. All this stuff is considered an asset if the cost of that asset exceeded $500. If you went and bought a workbench on Kijiji for 25 bucks, I would just expense that. Don't worry about depreciating it. That bench may last you a long time, but the cost is minimal in compared to depreciate it. Like it doesn't make sense. Okay, assets are grouped into different classes. Each class has a different percentage rate assigned to it. And the thing about CCA is very important. In a year, you're not making a lot of money. And let's say you have a whole bunch of assets. Like I know some of the music, musicians out there have a ton of assets. Don't claim this depreciation if you don't need it. Save it for a year that you're making money and you need it to reduce your income to pay less taxes. Oh, sorry. I hear you. Um, so, okay. um, about the, the vehicle, the, yeah. the mileage summary. And can you do an 
address receipts, if you can prove the travel itself by way of invoice from out of town subcontractors. Okay. Oh, I see what you're getting at. Here's the thing. You have to have your receipts first. Number one. Secondly, if you can't quite figure out your exact mileage, do a reasonable estimate and we'll take a percentage of those expenses based on your estimate. But if you ever got audited, you're going to have to prove to CRA how you came up with that estimate. So that's what I'm saying. If Just grab some type of app now and get started. That's probably the best way to do it. There's, oh, I don't know, track my drive and I don't know, there's all these ones. I'm old school people. I write it down in my day timer and I add it up at the end of every month <laughs> because I really, I can't, I, I way too many apps and things going on, so I don't do that. But you cannot claim a certain amount per mileage. Like, let's say you go 100 kilometers, you go, can I claim 50 cents a kilometer? No, you have to have receipts as a proprietorship. If you are a corporation, you have different avenues. Yes, and we can talk about that. If anybody is a corporation, I can tell you how you can deal with that that's different than a proprietorship because you're dealing with a separate legal entity, a corporation. Okay, when do I register for GST? I just want you to know, if you hit over 30,000 in four consecutive calendar quarters, or 30,000 in a single calendar quarter, you must register for GST. Once you are registered, you have to collect it on all the goods you sell, and then you get to deduct what's called ITCs, all input tax credits, all the amounts of GST you pay out on your expenses. You're filing a separate return. You're giving CRA here, I charge this on my goods. I paid this out on expenses. You either give them what you owe them or they give you back what they owe you. That can happen too. You can also register with GST voluntarily if you want, but once you register, you are registered. Unless you go out of business. And then you phone them up and say, I don't, I'm not doing this anymore. I have to cancel my registration. So at the bottom, I put separate GST is charged on income and paid on expenses to report on a GST return. GST uh, charged minus GST paid equals your refund or your amount owing. Do not, if you are registered for GST, you can't include anything to do with GST on our spreadsheets. We have a separate column to help you separate it out. Do you have any GST questions? Okay, well, because we, we don't want to go too, too long. I think we could go maybe about 10 after uh, yeah. something. Gross, gross income. Sorry, did I not put that on there? Uh, 30, no, I didn't. Should 30,000 gross, okay? Okay, can we claim that? Can we answer that one later? Yeah, That's a very specific yeah. question. Make sure you flag that one. Okay, yeah. we'll answer the partnership one later. Um, so GST is charged on things like performance fees. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Okay, no, it's only on self employed income. Hey, I need to change that slide to be a bit more specific. GST, okay, the small supplier threshold. I shouldn't use GST terms. See that? I used a GST term. It's only if you are self-employed. If you also have an employment job, there is no GST charge when you're an employee. The, um, and also for any of you who teach any type of music lessons or art lessons, that's, a, I don't know about art lessons. Let me double check on that. Music lessons, you are exempt from paying GST on those music lessons. So guitar lessons and stuff like that. Actually, I don't think it is the, art, the general arts. I think it's just music. Uh, we'll double check that one, okay? But once you're registered, let's say you have four different proprietorships. Uh, if Once you're registered for one, all of them have to be registered. Uh, because you are the business. You are those proprietorships. So that's when that comes in. Only on self-employed income, though. Uh, GST is charged on performance fees. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Inventory, some spark, uh, sponsorship income, some consignment sales. That one you got to be careful on, okay? That is totally something that usually you have to phone the GST technical interpretations and rulings. Consignment sales are very, very tricky. I, can't, I don't even have the time to go into that one. There's no GST on 
non-resident stuff. So if you, an income you earn in the US is not subject to GST, you can't charge them GST. If you have downloads here, I have a lady who does uh, gaming on Twitch through US PayPal, Twitch, she's going through US Twitch, US PayPal, there is no GST on it. You will see on some of the sites now, if there's a Canadian site, they will charge GST. So this is really touchy stuff. If you're in that situation, you can call a professional or you can get a hold of CRA. You want GST technical interpretations and rulings because usually the frontline worker can't answer you. Well, that's horrible to say, but it's true. <laughs> Income earned in the US, we touched that. But here's the problem, and I'll touch on this briefly. If all of your income was earned in the U.S. and you made $100,000, you can't charge GST on that. But GST expects you to register for GST. Why? Because you're not going to be paying any GST on it, okay? So you will be able to claim your ITCs, the amount you paid out in Canada uh, that had GST on it. So there you go. Another very complicated area. Best to get professional advice on it. Uh, ITC is input tax credit, okay? It's claimed on a lot of different things, but the thing is it's not claimed on insurance pre premiums, union dues. Take a look at the receipts. If you have a band member or a subcontractor that is not registered for GST, you don't pay them GST once you're registered. They have to also be registered. And you know how you know if they are? Ask them for their GST number. I've had guys in a band say, I'm registered, so they want the extra 5%. Guess what? Where's your number, guy? I go to CRA and say, is this an, a valid uh, GST number? No. This is where paperwork proves it. The GST number, anybody who gets an invoice from me, you've seen it. There's my GST number on there, right? I have to have it on there. Uh, here's a really crazy area. Uh, donating services to charities. I think it's very, very important. that There's a difference if it's a musician, visual artist, or writers. A lot of this information can be found in this thing called an income tax folio now. This income tax folio used to be called an interpretation bulletin, an IT. So for those of you who have been around a bit, you'd see it being called an IT. They call it an income tax folio now. Somebody in Ottawa got a job changing the name. Because basically the information in most of these is exactly the same as it's always been. I don't get it. But anyway, but <clears throat> here's something to keep in mind. Charity can issue a charitable donation for donations of cash and goods. A charity cannot issue a charitable donation receipt for services donated. And here's the thing with artists. How do I value my inventory I may be donated? That's where you got to get into this income tax folio and take a quick look at it and then discuss this with a professional. And I'll tell you a trick that a lot of uh, musicians do. So they go and they do, they perform at a charity and the charity pays them minimal amount, $300, right? They report it. They give the $300 back to the charity because now they've donated cash, not just their service, and they get a donation receipt. There's a ways around things. And a lot of people just do it because they want to help out. So there, that's why donating services to charities is very complicated and really, um, if you have a specific question about this, it would be really good if you phone me and we can, we can get going on that one, okay? And what is inventory quickly is what is inventory, what you paid to purchase an item for or what it costs you to make an item, like a paint, uh, your canvases, your sculpture medium, your CDs, your T-shirts. Inventory has to be accounted for at year end. You've taught, heard about businesses counting for their inventory. Artists have to count for it. However, and don't confuse it with stuff you just give away, keychains, guitar picks, pens, fridge magnets, right? Um, here's the thing is that for artists, there's two ways to value your inventory. Uh, visual artists, and this is the hard part. Visual artists and writers have to go to this income tax folio. And I'll briefly explain this because it's going to confuse a lot of people because you're going to go, I don't even know what inventory is. Now we're talking about how do I value it? Here's what happened that changed a lot of this. Usually when you create something like a CD or anything like that, you've got a lot of costs that go with it. That's the cost of your inventory that you match with your sales. A writer, for example, or a painter. Let's say a painter is painting and painting and they have all these costs. They have research. They have 
their paints, they have their easel, they have their uh, workspace, they have research, et cetera, et cetera. All of a sudden, they don't have, they haven't sold a painting in five years, but they're stuck not being, they were stuck not being able to claim any of their expenses. CRA came up and said, look, you get to value your inventory at nil, so you get to deduct some expenses instead of waiting till you become famous and can sell a painting. That's what this is all about, okay? So that's why I don't want to get too much into it. And it also talks about donating to charities. So that would confuse a lot of people, I'm sure. <laughs> well, call me, I'll help you with it, okay? Business, what is a business number? This is your identifying number for GST, payroll, corporate tax, and other information slips. Most proprietorships, if you're not registered for GST and you don't have payroll, you are recognized by your social insurance number on your personal tax return. And here's your business number down here to talk to CRA. And a lot of people get my account and my business account because you can watch what's happening with your tax information. I highly recommend it, especially with all these cyber scams going on. A lot of people got their information stolen. Set up my account or my business account to watch what, what's happening with your business. The business account, I'm sorry, is only for people that do have a business number, GST, payroll, corporate tax. Otherwise, you do it all through your social insurance number through my account, okay? An audit. Well, here we go. There's going to be a ton of them this year. <laughs> I think I saw another couple of professionals on there, and they know what this year is going to be. This year and next year are going to be very scary for us um, because we've got, CRA hasn't set proper guidelines. We've got a lot of confusion going on. But they, uh, they monitor it to inspect your GST returns, your income tax return, your payroll records, other rebirth, rebates. If you are doing this yourself, work with your auditor, explain your unique business to them, and provide all supporting documents they ask for. If you messed up and you go, oh, my God, I can't believe I said this to them or they interpreted this, whatever, you always have the right to appeal. If you disagree with the outcome of an audit, a notice of objection, though, must be filed within 90 days of your reassessment notice. There are a few circumstances that you could file late, but let's just put it this way for now. 90 days from your notice of reassessment, and unless you've got a situation where you go, can I still file uh, an objection? We can help you take a look at it. Okay. And this is the time it's best to get a professional involved. Um, you can represent yourself in an appeal. You can represent yourself at the first level tax court, but you have to know what you're doing and be careful, okay? And here's some of the electronic services available. My business account, my account, my payment, represent a client, uh, direct deposit, electronic payments. There's a taxpayer bill of rights, which is really important if anybody starts talking to you nasty, which most people shouldn't. Uh, even collections is being very, very nice these days. So COVID did some good things. <laughs> one <laughs> so there's a payroll calculator there's important dates and these q and a's right now for all the emergency response benefit programs are extremely good st start if you're having a bit of an issue it's a good place to start okay and that is the end of my show so i'm going to stop sharing now and we're going to answer some questions that would, yeah yeah so where are we going with the questions I'm going to drink water about that. Now, just wait. End of show. Just wait. Stop sharing. Oh, now you get to see a blank screen. Oh, there we are. Well, it all depends, okay? It all depends what we've got to do. But that first 15 minutes that I give you will be free. And then at that point in time, we can see what you need done. It all depends if you're just needing consulting. And it depends if you're needing to be taught how to keep track of your business expenses. It depends if you need tax returns filed with uh, proprietorship income. It depends if you need troubleshooting with CRA. I tend to be, and so are a couple of professionals I've seen on here, uh, quite reasonably priced because we don't run great big accounting firms that have massive overhead, and they do have massive overhead, and we have to understand that. So uh, you can discuss that with me at that time, okay? No. Okay, next question. Someone uh, was saying that makeup for performing, that's the same as my usual look. 
No, because you had to have it anyways for your usual look. You know, the people that can, uh, is if you're an actress or an actor, you will have a case, a makeup case that you will be taking to where, to where you're doing your play. Um, you have that case that's specifically, usually for your performances. That's a little bit different. But everyday makeup, you would have been buying it anyway, so you used a little bit more for going on stage. Uh, no. They're really, they don't like that kind of stuff. But trust me, if you're reasonable and deducted a very small amount as materiality, you'd probably get away with it. But you'd have to, because it all depends if you're audited. I like to try and tell people a really hard, sort of tougher guidelines so that you know if you were going to push it to a little bit grayer area where, where your boundaries are. That's what I'm trying to do right now, okay? Another question? Projects. Well, if you aren't actively getting paid for them, why are you doing it? You can't deduct hobby, things that you're buying for a hobby. You have to be looking at, I do want to break into um, business, or I do want to become an independent journalist. If you are working towards a business and have a reasonable expectation of profit, I'm doing this because I do want to make money. Even though you haven't made money, yes, you could. But you have to look at why are you doing this for a business purpose? Janice, we need yes. you to we need you to repeat the question that Megan is asking you because the rest of us can't hear her. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I will. I will come. I could be more louder here too. Okay. I can just repeat it so yeah. that we're not too close. Okay. There. How's that? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, I never sorry. even thought about that. Uh, do we need to go back to those other ones? Should I repeat those ones? Yes. Let's, let's, move, let's move forward. Okay, we can move, okay, we can move forward. Okay. okay. Sorry. Uh, so there was also two other questions that I wanted in here was, can I deduct accounting fees and can I deduct a phone? A phone. Okay. In your business, if you had to incur accounting fees, so let's say you've got a proprietorship and you're going, okay, I, I can't do this, which is very difficult. Yes, my fee is deductible and you get an invoice from me and you should be getting an invoice from any other professional. So you have proof of what you paid. That's the accounting fees. What was the other question? That's a phone. Can I deduct my phone? Of course you can deduct your phone. See, <laughs> Sierra and, and I have had a little difference of opinion on this phone thing. Um, they've been very picky lately. And I always say, if you have the one cell phone and you need to be in contact because you're waiting for that call, you're waiting for a booking, you would think because of the way cell phones are structured now, you're going to pay the same amount whether you use it a bit for personal and a bit for business or a bit more for business and a little bit for personal. I've always deducted 100% for my clients. Now, CRA is coming back and saying no. So we need to look at reasonability. If you're really prospering in your business and you it would make sense that you could claim 100% of that phone because you're working at your business 100% of the time. I think we've got something we can justify. Yes. Okay, next question. How do I report income when my gallery sells a piece? Just my percentage or is there something about reporting 100% of the sale and paying my gallery their percentage and deducting that as an expense? Also, how does GST work then? Okay, this one is getting really complicated. Who who's that person? This is Julia. Um, I'm not, I okay, know. Julia, your question about if your gallery sells a piece for you, it can all depend on whether what the contract is with the gallery. Are you selling it on consignment? Are you selling it and then having to give them a fee afterwards? Are you, you know, are you, did you have to pay to have space in that gallery? There's a whole bunch of um, criteria that would, would happen as to how you would be reporting that, Julia. So if you could give me a call tomorrow, we could take a look at how your business is structured at that gallery. And then I can answer that and the GST question better for you. Because if you're selling on consignment, now we're getting into the very complicated area of GST and consignment sales. Okay. Next. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, oh, Ju wow, you spell it really neat. J U L Y. Okay. <laughs> I, I am very new to all of this because I am still a student. 
but I will be graduating soon and looking to venture into freelance. I have done some work already and have kept invoices, but at what point do I consider myself as self-employed? For in regular times, I am also a waitress. Okay, here's the thing. This person's asking, when am I self-employed? When do I really consider that I am in business? And she also works as a waitress. You can always work somewhere else, okay? A lot of people have numerous jobs, okay? At what point in time do you feel that you have an expectation of profit in your business and you've done everything a prudent business person would do to show the world you are now in business? So have you registered properly? Have you taken the... Do you have the proper credentials? Are you getting yourself out there? Do you have a website? Uh, there's so They put all that package together. Are you showing yourself you're in business and you want to make money? That's the time you are definitely in business. Otherwise, it's it's a bit of dabbling. Yet. You know, if you're just doing a little bit here, a little bit there, you haven't invested a lot of money or a lot of time, are you truly expecting to make a profit from that business? Even though you don't. As you know, artists often and farmers many other people don't always make money right away it takes many many years okay it's how you you um show yourself to the world are you in business okay hopefully that answers your question if you still have more questions feel free to call me and just say i was at the seminar last night okay just wait. megan's looking for more questions here what what if you use a really absurd amount of your house for art making what kind of documentation would you need to prove this and deduct this expense? Okay, someone's asked if I use a, a lot of, she used the word absurd amount of their yes, house yes. for art making. Yes. Um, and how would you, how much would you claim and how much you show to CRA? CRA can get really picky. We all use our kitchen table sometimes, forget about that one, okay? You are not sitting aside your kitchen table all the time for doing business and they'll get down to the point that they're going how many hours per day and how many days per week do you use that kitchen table <laughs> you don't even want to go there right now, i'm not sure what you mean by a certain amount but if you're art making i would presume maybe she could clarify that you'd have a studio maybe you'd have a basement maybe you'd have more of one area oh they literally have exhibitions in every room in the house and most of the yard exhibitions so you have clients coming there that's my question does she have clients coming there no clients collaborators not clients collaborators collaborate what oh people that help you with your artwork? i'm a little confused not, uh, no money exchanging I am an artist curator and we are making art together. Okay, you're making art together. I think what you're gonna have to do is take a look at how much of your uh, square footage, your house you're using on a more permanent basis and make it reasonable. So you may be using your yard sometimes, you may be using your basement sometimes, but take a look at what I've done. I set aside an area in my house I use 100% for business every day, except when I don't want to tell people I'm working, which is Saturday and Sunday, usually. So if you need to, if you want some more uh, clarity on that one, I'd ask that you call me as well, okay? Because that one's a little different. You can't go overboard because CRA is not going to let you claim that much of your house. Your house is meant to live in. If you needed to have an office space, they would let you claim the whole amount of that. Like if you, you know, pay money to a third party. Okay, did we have another question? Yes. We had to go back to some too, don't yes, forget. I know that's why I'm going back. Poor Megan. <laughs> okay. How much do you have to earn a year on your art, self employed, to be able to claim home and other expenses every year, even if you have an outside job for your main income? Okay, I just want to go back to something first. I had Ron pop up here and said, be careful what you claim on your house, especially if you have uh, assets. So in my office, I don't know if you can see behind me, you see those beautiful birds and maple cabinets? I have them all over my office. I could not claim the cost of those because they become attached to the house 
and would need to be appreciated. They are assets. Once I do that, I have lost this part of the house to claim for a principal residence designation. You know how everyone says, oh, if you sell your personal house, you don't have to pay any tax? Well, once you claim depreciation on part of your house, yes, you do have to pay tax. Do you think, Ron, would you just uh, let me know if I explained that well enough? I don't see why I'm popping back. I think that's okay. Sorry, what was the next question? Ron will pop back. I just I uh, interrupted that. He had another job. Oh, yeah. When can basically his home, when can he start claiming his office and home expenses? If that's the second job. It's okay. Just a minute. I'm gonna have to get you moved back because we're getting feedback. Okay. So, so he wants to know when he can claim office in the home when uh the self-employment is the second source of income and the employment's the first. It doesn't matter if you're really trying to get out there in business, you can claim part of your office and home and it's based on the square footage that you are setting aside to either meet clients or this is where you do your business all the time um so you can start claiming it if you are truly in business okay uh no problem there at all okay someone asked if you're doing self-tape auditions at home can you claim that area if you have i know a lot of artists who have a studio set up in their home and it's permanently there right so they can claim um See, oh, sorry, Ron, we'll look at a percentage use for business as well as CCA, right, Ron? I know. It gets complicated. Thank you, Ron, for bringing that up. But um, if you have a studio set up, that comes into the square footage calculation. But it can't just be set up Wednesday night, Friday night. You know, if you're just putting it and you're taking it down, putting it up, taking it down, you have to realize this is more uh, workspace. This is where you do your business on a more on a more permanent basis, whether you have an employment job or not. It's okay. It's truly okay. I was self-employed as a, I had a management company for an artist, and I worked at CRA, and I had um, a, another corporation. I can do all those things, but I spent the time in my office doing office work here, and when I was employed, I was gone. And sometimes, right, Ron is right, they may look at the percentage of time that you spend in that office. Um, that gets really nitpicky, but that can happen. Ron's right, if you're mostly making money somewhere else. It does get a little complicated. But talk to your professional, and, I'm, and if you're doing your own um, taxes, make sure you talk to someone about the office and home. Okay? I am doing employment for six months and self-employed for six months and you're truly separated most people aren't they're doing both of them at the same time i would say to be a bit more reasonable with your office and home and claim only 50 percent of the square footage if you're only using it 50 percent of the time and that was brought up by ron too is how much time do you use in that office okay especially that's a bigger divide most people are doing i'm going to work during the day and i work until midnight on my self-employed stuff and all weekend that's giving you a much even more even split. Not worry about it. Just to go on square foot. Okay. Can I ask a question Thanks. about serve? Oh yes. Oh yeah. When you have a serve question, okay. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I've done my own bookkeeping, and I have uh, an accountant who's who I've been working for with, with for six years. He's really good, and he's a musician as well, so he understands like my business. Good. Um, uh, the only thing is that serve is like it's so like it's such new territory. So like we're kind of wondering the whole like. You can't make it over a thousand dollars. It's like so great because it's like, in which I didn't when I like applied for like for the serve, but it's right. very great. So it's like, so it's it's all about like uh, accounts receivables, right? Like a cru what what is it called? A cruel, a cruel basis, or what did you call right. it? So like like for example, like it's just so weird. Like we might have an actual concert might be the transaction. Um, transcriptions, like I'm working on charts, but. I, 
they would never know when I'm working on the charts. I could I could say I worked on the charts in this month or in that month. No, it's not, okay, it's not when you're working on them. It's when you, those charts you have now contracted to sell to someone else. Yeah. Because if you're just working on charts for yourself, then you're just there's no deduction, right? Is it was for sale for sure the charts? Okay, it's, it's for and sale once it, it's ready to go and up for sale. Uh -huh. Aha. Then, then that would be at the time that you you are going to say, okay, it's up for sale, so it's going to be earned at that time that somebody agrees to buy it. Mm -hmm. What if they don't pay you for three months? Then yeah. the income is earned when you originally set the contract up. Fair enough. For example, yeah. grants, grants are something that's very interesting. So let's say you did all the paperwork for the grant in July. You said you were accepted in September, but you don't get paid till the following March. When is that income earned? Once they said you are, you can get it, not when they pay it out to you. Right. Yeah, because that this is, happened it, early on for me was that yeah. um, I lost a ton of work and then then I was getting paid, so it looked like I was busting the $1,000 limit, but that was like from work from January and February, so I think I'm good. Yeah, and if you were on a formal accounting program like QuickBooks or Simply Accounting, you would be automatically entering it into that software, that account, that accounting software at the time you earned it, not when you received it, because it would be set up as a receivable. Mm -hmm. But because a lot of small proprietorships aren't using proper accounting because they can't afford to have someone do it or they don't know it themselves, right? Then, then you're not seeing that right away. Somebody with a corporation would have said, okay, I applied for the grant, I, I, I uh, it said yes, it's becoming a receivable, in October, I get paid the next March. That's when, but I, I recorded his income when it's received, uh, re earned and receivable, not when received. Yes. So, so a good. lot of you that's artists good. are gonna have a really hard time when CRA comes along and say, well, were you over the thousand dollars? Cause they told us net at first. So it's your income minus your expenses, but because you're not keeping track of your, ex your income, and your expenses on formal accounting, you're gonna to have to go through and show them when you really earned that income, not when it was paid to you. Same with royalties. Royalties are another big one. Yeah, for sure. Okay. okay thanks. You're welcome. Hopefully that helped. And if, you, if your accountant wants to give me a call, we can have a chat, no problem. Okay, Caitlin, I saw a few more pop up. Oh, Caitlin. I call you Caitlin. <laughs> Megan, <laughs> I saw a few more chat. But I also work freelance occasionally on the side. I invoice my freelance work, but I also say I am self-employed and claim related expenses. If, if it, okay, it, so she's she's working for the uh, full-time theater, uh, full theater as an employee, and then doing some freelancing on the side. The employment income is reported on line 101 of your tax return. It used to be line 101 until they decided to change the darn numbers. And then your self-employed income is reported via a T2125. Yes, if you had expenses you had to incur to earn your freelance income, you can claim them, but they have to be business related, late expenses laid out to earn income. If you had an expense that was half for business and half for personal, then you put 50% on there. Like a cell phone, like they're saying cell phones, you gotta be more, you gotta put a percentage on them more than we've ever had to. I've had a few fights with CRA about that. I'm sure Ron has too. <laughs> Did that, I hope that answered your question. As long as you are reporting your contract income, you can claim any expenses you had to incur to, to do that freelance income. And that's separate from your, um, from your employment income. So for the people who are saying thank you, I see it pop up some time. You're very, very welcome. I hope we can do this again, okay? <laughs> Okay, do we have more questions? Yes. Okay, we have more questions for those of you who want to stick around for more questions. Okay. Yes, that bicycle. I know somebody who has a bicycle, and yes, he actually, it was a very expensive bicycle, so he set it up to depreciate it because it has an enduring benefit and it was very expensive. That and then repairs on that bicycle are definitely deductible. Public transportation is, and I didn't repeat the question, but I think I'll get this. One. Sorry, remind me, throw something at me to remind me here. Public transportation is, yeah, um, 
your bus, your buses, oh darn, those bus passes for employees are no longer deductible, but if you're self-employed, I would be keeping those slips or writing down how much you're paying for the bus. It's no different than if you had to take a taxi or an Uber, you can claim that, especially when it's minus 30. Okay, <laughs> okay what's okay, so questions? Am I correct in thinking that my services as an individual are separate from my services as part of a partnership? Example, I don't want to in my individual work. Okay, she's asking if her partnership is registered for GST as all as all her other um, businesses. If she was self-employed doing something else, does she have to register for GST? Partnerships are uniquely different. They're not proprietorships. So if the partnership is registered, your other proprietorships don't have to be registered for GST. Definitely get some advice about that. Um, oh yeah, and David's going to be sending out my contact info. I guess it would have been a good idea what I said. <laughs> okay, um, but yes, that's partnerships are uniquely different. I do have a couple of partnerships. They have other freelance income coming in. Only the partnership is registered. It's almost like a corporation is almost like it's a separate entity, okay? And you're welcome, everyone who's saying thank yous. Okay, more questions? Um, We're having fun here. Will, how will a grant affect my EI? I'm, I'm not sure. Well, how does a grant affect your EI? Yeah, that's a question you're going to have to ask EI. Um, because it is actually self-employed income. but I, I must say EI has its own very, very particular rules. And if you can get through on the phone to EI, that would be good. Or we could look that up for you if you want to call tomorrow and we can uh, do some research. I'm not sure. Are you making like, I'm not I'm sure not a grant sure affects well. your EI. It's part of your self-employed income, so it might, depending on how that grant had to be reported. Because grants are reported very differently. Okay. Um, do we have more questions? Yes, we do. So yes. Can I ask a question? Oh, sorry. Just wait. Yes. Sorry. I I'm trying to make a decision. I'm applying for a grant. They do not fund sole proprietors. So I either have to apply as a um, ad hoc group or as a corporation. What kind of grant are you applying for? Just can I just can I just go back one little bit here? I had somebody pop up here and said they've called EI and grants are not considered part of your income for EI. I just popped back. Did you see that, Megan? Okay. So okay, I'm sorry. So you're applying for a grant and they're saying are they saying you need a um um business number? Well, well. Either I have to apply as an ad hoc group or as a corporation. Oh, do not incorporate if you don't need to. Trust me, you're getting yourself into a whole ball of wax there. Um, I know some artists who have had to um, go to CRA and get a business number and call it a payroll number just so that they have that business number for the grant purposes. And then you never file payroll, but you've got the business number. You can phone up Siri and just say, no, I don't have payroll this year. I thought I was hiring someone, but you still have the business number. But don't incorporate okay. Are you making, like, if you're not making over 100,000 at least and leaving some of that money in the corporation, I would not be incorporating uh, because the co you have to have uh, formal bookkeeping, you have to pay the cost of doing corporate tax returns that can range from fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars a year. You ca you and the corporation are separately you're separate legal entities, so any money you take out of that corporation has to be accounted for as either repayment of a loan or salaries or dividends. It's a whole. If you I would never incorporate just for that reason. I just get myself a business number. And I think you probably talked to David or they do grants all the time for the artist. He may be able to give you a hand on what that yeah, the grant you're looking for is asking for. 
I'm, I'm dealing with, this is Canadian heritage, and they won't deal with an individual. Well, get a so business they, number and say you're a proprietorship. Because then you have a business, but you're just not incorporated. A proprietorship is a business, it's just a non-incorporated business. Oh, okay. So just ask him if I, if you get a business number for your self-employed earnings, um, then then um, would that qualify? Okay. Megan, can you go down to the bottom and see some of the questions that are popping up right now, though? Yeah. Okay. Okay, give that a try, and you can always call me back, okay? Not the same thing as GST number. Don't register for – no, it is – the same but you have to register specifically for gst and don't do it if you're not gst able because once you do you have to charge gst on all your income you make through your proprietorship but i already had to register oh. in the past okay so i have a gst number just wait G david said he'll call you tomorrow judy on this situation okay and, and guide you through this process okay Great, thank you. thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we got some more questions. Um, somebody wants to know that I charge for charity. Sounds like they only reward non-profit. Somebody up there wanted to know about honorariums, though. Oh, honorariums. If somebody wants to know about honorariums, um, oh, what's uh, Caitlin's saying? Something here. We'll see. Let's talk to her. Yeah, honorariums are definitely taxable. Yes. But is there GST on an honorarium? Yes. I think. Otherwise, I've just done an invoice wrong. Uh, <laughs> I have to double check that. If you're registered for a GST, I think you do have to charge it on honorarium. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> Okay, Caitlin was answering so something. Okay, how do I claim grants on my tax return if I do not have a business number? A lot of grants you don't need a business number. There must there's just a few specific ones. Factor, I don't think factor you have to. I don't think uh, Edmonton Arts Council you have to either. So the thing is you will get a slip and it'll be a T4A slip. It'll tell you what where that goes on your tax return. There's no guessing because if you look at the information on the back, it'll say you report this on line 130. You report it as part of services in as your self-employed income. If it's filled out properly, it'll tell you where you report it. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Next one. I lost my job. I applied for my tax return one grant and my food. Will it impact my EI benefit? Oh, sorry. Okay, we answered the EI, okay, oh, on the grants, okay? Okay. Um, sorry, okay, Megan's got a lot of questions here, so we're trying to go from the bottom back up again and see if we can um, pick some that haven't been asked. So, I also have your opinion on what the best software for book, uh, what the best software for bookkeeping is and how long should you keep your, your uh, documents okay. for? Best software for bookkeeping? is depending on your knowledge if you are a, a smaller proprietorship i go with the spreadsheets which david can send out to you if you'd like if you uh feel that you have a good tax and accounting background i would definitely use quickbooks but do not use quickbooks online i don't even know why they sell that because of the amount of messes that happen with that one is horrible the regular quickbooks um Simply accounting is more for people with a solid, solid uh, accounting background. So I would say QuickBooks um, on your PC or your Mac would be the best way if you have a good accounting and or tax background. A little bit of both would help. Or a spreadsheet. Spreadsheets just work. If you're not a, if you're a corporation, you can't use a spreadsheet, but a proprietorship, you can. Okay. Hopefully that answered your question too. Okay, did you have some more? Um, I don't know. I believe that's it. Someone had an RIC question, but then later on said that they would just contact you. Okay. So. Okay. Um, okay, let's open it up. Does anybody have any other questions right now? We had quite a few people leave. I guess they've 
Okay, the royalties earned prior to the serb period, that means that you were entitled to get the royalty, it just wasn't paid to you, it could have been paid in the serb period, which does look like it's messing things up. But as we've talked before, it's when income is receivable or earned, not when received. So if those royalties were supposed, to, they said you're getting royalties from SOCAN or from yeah, any of the other ones, right? They, if, uh, get the inheritance one after this, okay? Um, if they were supposed, if they were receivable by you for uh, work you had done prior to the CERB period, they are, would not affect your CERB income. But please, if you get questioned by CRA, get a professional, um, like, like Ron or myself or whomever, and we can help clarify that to CRA. What was the inheritance question? Uh -huh. Oh, oh, so, okay, this, oh, one more question, David, was how long do you have to keep your records? Technically seven years. Um, and we'll talk quickly about the inher inheritance Go one, ahead, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Will my <laughs> affect my service CRB? No. Inheritances are non-taxable. Go and have some fun or invest some. You don't have to report. In Canada, there is no taxes on inheritance. Lucky you. Hopefully it helps your life right now because we'd all like one right now. I'll tell you. Not we wouldn't like somebody to pass, but you know how it is. So uh, uh, folks, I, I'm going to uh to beg off. Uh Janice has been so extraordinarily generous of her time. Megan, thank you so much, both of you. Um, but I asked her to do an hour-long workshop, and she's been working her butt off for, for uh, getting close to two hours now. So I'm going to ask you to join me in saying thank you. I'm going to crash the, the server now by asking all of you who are still with us to turn on your cameras, uh, join us, turn on your microphone. This is the one of the few chances to say hello to each other. Um, oh, so I recognize you. some people. Uh, Sorry. Thank you. If you change your view to view everybody, you'll see who's who's still with us and able to join us. Thank you all so much. I hope you're able to join us for more sessions in the future. Um, again, I will send out um, emails and websites and, and phone numbers for, for Janice's business. Um, maybe bother her tomorrow with questions um, so that she doesn't just keep working through the night. Um, again, yeah, thank tomorrow, you. not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much and have a wonderful night. Thanks for attending. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Oh, Thank, you so Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.